Praise God. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I want to talk about something this morning. It's not an unfamiliar subject, but maybe it's just a refresher for us because sometimes we get in this mindset of we study this, we look at this, we get wrapped up in our jobs, we get wrapped up in the world, we get wrapped up in all kinds of other things, and we tend to leave the important things behind that we don't refresh our memory on it, we don't refresh our heart on it, we don't help re-engrave it on the tablet of our heart. And if we're not careful, those things will begin to fade away and they become less important to us, less apparent to us. So I want to talk about us being the temple of God. Especially in these last days, we've got to be the temple of God. We can't be some shallow existence. We can't be some whited sepulcher. We can't be all of these things that are pretty on the outside but full of dead men's bones and have death on the inside of us. We've got to have life, life more abundantly. But that requires us to be the temple of God to house the Spirit of God on the inside of us. Now, just so we make the difference, there is a difference And what we know from the day of Pentecost, from being born again to being baptized in the Spirit, so just maybe a quick review for us. When the Word talks about having the Spirit in you, that's you being born again. The Spirit in you. Spirit in you. It's like even Jesus breathed on His disciples and they had the Spirit in them, which means they were born again. But when it talks about on you or of the Spirit or things that are talking about having the power, especially after the day of Pentecost, They walked in the power. Why? Because they were baptized. They were covered in the Spirit. So it's one thing to be covered in the Spirit, which we all need. It's a resource that God has made available to us. And he even tells, Jesus tells the disciples in Acts chapter 1, don't go anywhere till you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Then in Acts chapter 2, they get baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they have the freedom, the power, and the authority. Because, I mean... If you can't tell by Acts chapter 2, by the beginning of it, they're all in one mind and one accord. They're praying. The Holy Spirit moves, comes in, baptizes them all in the Holy Spirit. And then all of a sudden, Peter turns around and starts preaching the message. (laughs) He starts preaching with a boldness. Why? Because he had the power and the authority. Whereas, you know, weeks before, this young damsel, this young, young lady who's standing by fire, he's scared of and begins to deny Jesus. But yet the same man, given the opportunity to repent, now has the boldness, the power, and the authority up on him. Not just the Holy Spirit in him, but up on him has that power and authority to preach a message and people are born again. <laughs> so there's a difference. So, But I want us to realize from this message, we're not splitting hairs on that for this message, but when we talk about being the temple of the Holy Ghost, that means it's got to start, the Holy Spirit starts within us And we've got to be holy and be clean and to be what God wants us to be and allow that baptism to give us the authority and the power because we're already clean, because we're already housing Him on the inside. He baptizes us to give us the power and authority to walk in that cleanliness, to walk in that power that He's given us to be witnesses to everybody around us. Because if you're wanting to be baptized on the outside but you're dirty on the inside... God will use a donkey. God will use a donkey. But that's no way to live. I would, I would rather be used of God day in and day out. Say, Father, I, I messed this up. Please forgive me. Cleanse me. And then renew my relationship with him. Just keep walking and saying, all right, God, I thank you for cleansing me. I thank you for helping me. May I not go back to that sin? May I not go back, go back to that mistake? I'd rather do that time and time again than to be a donkey who's just used every once in a while. <laughs> God needs soldiers, not donkeys. Anyway, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? Notice in. Which ye have of God, and you are not your own? Now, I want to already kind of insert here. It says, and you are not your own. The New Living Translation of that says, you do not belong to yourself. You do not belong to yourself. That is, that, in my opinion, and you don't have to take that because it's my opinion. My opinion, that will be the biggest hurdle for many Christians. As they won't understand, they don't belong to themselves. 
And that will be the biggest hurdle because everything in their life revolves around them. They think about what they want. They think about how they want to do it, how they want to live their life, what they want to chase after, what they want to do. And they'll never reach even this fundamental foundation teaching of being a true Christian. Because Paul says you don't belong to yourself. He's not talking the fivefold. He's talking to a church in, Cor in Corinth. He's saying all of you, none of you, when you belong to God, when you are sold out to Him, when you're His temple, you don't belong to yourself. That's why in Romans it tells us we're a living sacrifices. We lay ourselves down to say not my will but your will be done. God, not what I want but what you want. So, Verse 20, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body, which is, glorify God in your body and your, in your spirit, which are God's. Now, I want us to notice something. Verse 19, notice it says, your body is the temple, not was, is. That's present tense. It is the temple. Notice verse 20. Ye, for ye are bought. That's past tense. The price has already been paid. But we've got to be the temple. <laughs> you were bought. The price has already been paid. So bought there means to purchase, to redeem. When you're bought, you purchase or redeem. We understand that. We'll go to the store. We'll buy something. Well, when you buy it, it belongs to you. Right? Right? And you might want to have the receipt because if you try to walk out of there with no receipt and all of a sudden an alarm goes off, they're going to think you stole it. But when you have the receipt, the evidence that you purchased it, then you can walk out of there even if the alarm goes off. No, I've got my receipt. Shows I paid for it. And then you're able to walk out. <laughs> where's, where's God's receipt in our life? Where's God's evidence that he's purchased us? Because many people will say, well, I'm the temple of God. I'm the temple of God. Well, where's the evidence? Because you look dirty, you smell dirty, you talk dirty, you act dirty. You got all these other things that show you really don't look like you belong to God. There's no evidence. There's no receipt of change from, we'll say, there's no receipt of changing hands from the devil to God. So where's your receipt? Where's, where's, where's the transaction? Where does it happen? There should be an evidence because there used to be death in your eyes because you were, you were coming to the wages of sin, which is death. And then when you have this transformation happen because the price has already been bought, you've already been bought, so now you choose by through repentance and obeying God, crying out unto Him, making Jesus your Savior, making Him your Lord and Master, making God your Father. There should be a receipt that happens even in your eyes that show the light of God, that show the life of God. There should be the fruit of the Spirit that are becoming evident in your life. Even as a baby Christian, there should be at least joy that's on your face because you know, I once was going to hell, now I'm going to heaven. I once was bound to this, now I'm set free and I'm a slave to God. <laughs> there should be some kind of difference. But if you declare that you're the temple of God, but yet you still live dirty, where's your receipt? Where's your evidence? But it says, for you are bought with a price. Now, price means value. You're bought with preciousness. You're bought with honor. <laughs> Therefore, glorify God. It means to honor, magnify Him, give esteem. So because He buys you with a price, he buys you, he buys you and puts a value on you, gives you an honor of purchasing you, gives you a preciousness. Therefore, we in return honor Him, we magnify Him and give Him esteem in our body. Notice, that's the first thing it lists. It doesn't, just, it doesn't say with your mouth. You glorify God in your body. That should be the evidence to everybody around you that's your receipt. It's because I no longer do those old things. I no longer chase after those old things. I glorify God in my body. I honor Him by what I do. I honor Him by what I am. I magnify Him by who I am now. 
And my actions of where my feet go. My feet don't go, no longer go to those old places. My mind no longer goes to those old places. My, I don't find myself doing those old things. My mouth doesn't talk the same. So that's your evidence of the change of what's happening in your life. Because you know, I'm not my own. I don't belong to myself. So I can't do those old things. <laughs> when Miss Tiffany and I first got married, I had to come to the realization, I can't do whatever I used to do. Being a single man. Oh, come on now. If you want to get married now like you're still single, there's something jacked up about that. How come we do the same thing to God? Oh, God, I love you. I want to marry you. I want you to be my husband. I want you to, to be in my life. And then we act like we're still single. Go flirt with the devil. Go flirt with the world. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Amen. But we're not our own. My, my body is no longer mine. It's also my wife's. Her body is no longer just hers. It belongs to me. That's the word of God. Don't care what your opinion is. You can smoke up your opinion all you want to. But the, the word of God says that your body no longer belongs to just you when you're married. So why do we think we can do that unto God? Well, God, I love you. I know that we're in a covenant. Covenant is not a contract. Covenant is much deeper than that. Covenant is what you are when you're married. A covenant is what you walk in with God. Now you tell me how important it is to God when He declares that a covenant between Him and a person and a covenant between a man and a woman in marriage, how He correlates both of them and how important they are. They shouldn't be a contract that's easily broken. They're a covenant which lasts forever. So when we have this covenant with God, we can't just say, well, I made this covenant with you, God, now I'm just going to do my own thing. No, 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 no. You don't belong to you. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Then he says, and in your spirit. Then Paul goes on to say, which are God's? They don't belong to you. They belong to him. So it's best just to obey him. Best to glorify him on your own because you belong to him anyway. But many times what, we, what some Christians do is they'll declare, they'll start a covenant with God, and then all of a sudden it's not what they wanted. All of a sudden it's not exactly how they wanted to live their life. So what do they do? They try to exchange it. They try to go back, I want a refund on this. I want a refund. I know I belong to Him, but I want evidence that I'm going back to, I'm going back to my sinful nature. I'm going back to where I originally came from, which is dirt. You want to go back to dirt? You want to go back to filthy living? And go back to your carnal nature because that was working so well for you to begin with. <laughs> Why don't we change our mind and our heart to line up with God instead of trying to change who we belong to and who we have a covenant with? Because many people, they get disinterested in a marriage and they'll say, well, I'm done. I'm ready for a divorce just because I'm tired of you. We've been together for so long. I'm just done. I'm ready to move on. That's not why... That's not why that you move on in a marriage. That's not why you get a divorce. There's only three or four biblical reasons to get a divorce. Biblical reasons for a divorce. <laughs> That's not popular now. Because people don't want to talk about that. Anyway, another message for another time. I encourage you to look at biblical marriage. Some of the lessons we've written and taught here. We can maybe teach it again in the future. But we had that available if you ever want to look at that. Anyway, it's probably the most set of curriculum I've ever written was on biblical marriage. Why? Because people of God need to know what a biblical marriage looks like, not what the world says it looks like. And you'll also see that that goes hand in hand with your relationship with God. So if nothing else, maybe you're single and prepare for marriage, study it. If you're, if you're already married, let me work on your marriage. Maybe if you just want to see how you're supposed to walk with God, look at that curriculum. It'll tell you because there's multiple uses all throughout the Bible where God relates our Christianity and our walk with Him to marriage. But we are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. Let's back up a couple of chapters to chapter 3. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Oh, this sounds familiar. Know ye not that you are the temple of God? <laughs> Temple, by the way, means a shrine, a place in which devotion is paid. 
A place in which devotion is paid. Hmm. Now, we may say sanctuary. You could kind of maybe correlate the two. Temple of God, sanctuary. That's what we have here in our church. We have a sanctuary that we honor God with. It's a place that is, we keep it devoted to holiness unto God. That also means, temple means holy place as well. But I like how this puts it. Ye are the temple of God. You are the temple. You are. Remember how we looked at chapter 6. It says, your body is. This says, you are. Not you were. You should be. It says, you are. When you're born again, you are. But let's get a little bit, little bit more into this. You know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. And he's asking a question. Know ye not that you're the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Verse 17. If <laughs> any man defile the temple of God, the word defile there means to ruin or to shrivel. If you ruin or shrivel the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Now here's something that you may not catch in the King James unless you study it out. The word defile and the word destroy are the same. It says, if any man defile or ruin or shrivel the temple of God, him shall God ruin or shrivel. Hmm. That doesn't sound like the God that most modern preachers talk about. Well, God wouldn't do that to you. God would never do this. God would never do that. This directly says, if you defile the temple, if you defile your body, because remember the verse before it says, know ye not that you are the temple of God? It says, if you defile you, then God's going to destroy you. God's going to, he's going to ruin and shrivel you up. That shows how serious he is. But most Christians just, well, la di da I'll just do whatever I want to. I'll just be a floozy. I'll just be a drunk. I'll just be a this. I'll just be a that. I'll just be a liar. I'll just be a whatever. This says that God will destroy you. God will ruin you and shrivel you up. Then all of a sudden you wonder, well, why is everything in my life shriveling up? Why is this? Why is this happening? Why is that happening? Because God's taking his hand of protection off of you and saying, you wanted to be your own God, so there you go. I'm not going to protect you. I'm just going to, I'm going to allow you to be ruined and allow you to shrivel up because you've cut yourself off the vine. Remember that verse? What did Jesus say? You cut Those that are cut off, off the vine... The, the laborers come by and they gather all of them up and they pitch them in the fire. That's hell. It's bad enough when somebody comes along and tries to cut you off and say, well, you don't need that. You don't need church. You don't need this. You don't need that. That's bad enough. But when you're the idiot standing on the limb and you're sawing the branch by yourself, that's even dumber. I don't need this tree. I don't need this tree, not realizing you're standing on the branch. And as soon as that thing snaps, you're gone. But this says, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Now we could say, defile the temple of God, the Amplified says, who corrupts it with false doctrines or destroys it. Hmm. Amplified steps it up a notch. Not only do you defile it, but you allow the perversion to come through false doctrines. You mean like doing whatever you want to do? Living life however you want to do? Living, doing however you want to do? Saying whatever you want to say? Going against the Word of God when you defile it with false doctrines? Because you're allowing yourself... Because really what you're doing when you give in to false doctrines, you say, that's too hard. I don't want to do that. I want to give this one because it's easier. Because this, this doctrine suits me better. I like this better. But you got to remember, we're not our own. It doesn't matter what we like. I preached a message one time called, God doesn't care how you feel. He wants you to see. He wants you to, to see what He has for you. He wants you to see the life that He desires for you. He doesn't care about how you feel about it. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't... You know, sometimes you don't like me as your pastor. Sometimes I don't like you as a sheep. It's okay. That's a joke. Don't get offended because that's what the enemy wants. <laughs> Verse 18. 
Let no man deceive himself. That takes it all out right there. Let no man deceive himself. Don't deceive yourself because it's easy. It's easy to deceive yourself because you want to be deceived. You're looking for something to blind you. You're looking for something to get in your way. (laughs) You're looking for something to get you in trouble. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, or we would say this age, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. That means when you're wise in your own eyes, you usually fall prey to your own traps. You usually fall prey to your own devices. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are in vain. The word vain means empty, profitless, or an idol. Empty, profitless, or an idol. So the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise. Even though they think they're wise in their own eyes. Oh, I got this. Oh, I'm so smart. Oh, I got this. I'm wise. Really, when it comes down to it, all of their thoughts are empty. They're profitless. They don't profit anybody. They don't even profit themselves. And they become an idol. Because knowledge puffeth up. Well, I know better than this. I can do this. I can do that. I know more than that, pastor. I know more than this. I know more than that. Well, good for you. What are you doing with that with God? Instead of just running your mouth, acting like you know everything. Because remember, we don't belong to ourselves. We belong unto God because we're the temple of God. So we're supposed to belong unto Him. We speak when He says to speak. We're quiet when He says to be quiet. We do what He wants us to do. It's not all about us. <laughs> it's not all about us. We don't focus on what we know and things of that nature. Because we don't belong to ourselves. We're here to glorify God. We're here to honor Him in everything we say and do. So let's go to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Gonna look at an example of Jesus. Praise God. You know, to be Christians, we're to heed what Jesus says. And Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It means you'll keep His word of what He tells you to do. Well, that's one of the reasons the enemy doesn't want you to read the red letters, according to some Bible. Some of them just have it in all black, but some have it in red letters, saying what Jesus said. It's important for us to know what he said, for us to keep those things, because we love him. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not always a sappy person, but when people will get me birthday cards, or and Miss Tiffany gets me an anniversary card, or Veterans Day card, things like that, I keep those things. Because I am a little sappy to that degree. But not completely. Why? Why do I want to keep those things? Because I want to keep those words close by me to remember what they've said. To remember they took the time to write in this card to bless me and to love on me. So I want to keep those words close. Well, if anybody else is like that and they keep, you know, those cards like that, why don't we do the same thing with Jesus? Why don't we keep the word of God close to our heart to see what he said about us, to see what will help set us free, to help see what we need to do as Christians? Why don't we keep that word? Because he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, which means you'll keep his word. You'll keep it close by you. You'll write it on the tablet of your heart. But verse 34, so Mark chapter 8, verse 34. And When he had called the people unto him with his disciples, he said unto them, whosoever will come after me, not chase him, as in coming after him as a killing, but whoever come after me, follow me. Let him deny himself. Now that means to abstain, disown, lose sight of oneself and own interest. That sounds familiar. To affirm that one has a connection with. Hmm. That sounds like 1 Corinthians. But it says he would deny himself and take up his cross, which means to lift, raise up, bury, or carry, or bear. Take up his cross and follow me. Now follow means to be in the same way with. To accompany as a disciple or companion. Okay, so we preached this not extremely long ago, but quite a few weeks ago. From Matthew, looking at Mark's account, verse 35. And whosoever means anybody. Anybody. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. The word save means preserve or protect. Anybody, doesn't matter who you are, you try to save and preserve and protect 
your own life, what's it say? You shall lose it. Lose means you'll destroy it. You'll make it perish. So when you try to live your life, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. But Jesus just said, if you belong to him, you'll deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow him. There's a reason he says that verse and goes straight into whoever will save his life shall lose it. You try to protect your way of living. You try to protect what you think. You try to protect the way you want to do life. He says, you're going to lose it. You're going to squander it. Because you're not, whatever you're trying to protect, however you're trying to live your life because you belong to yourself, you're actually going to lose your life because you're not obeying God. Because you, you are rejecting God's temple claim on your life. You're, you're saying, I'm no longer the temple, I'm my own God. So I'm a temple not for God, but a temple of self. Which is exactly what the world wants you to be. It's exactly what the enemy wants you to be. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life, that word being the same, means whoever destroys or makes perish his life. That doesn't mean you kill yourself as in suicide. That means you get rid of your lust. You get rid of the things that your, sin, your sinful nature desires. You get rid of the way you want to do life. You get rid of those things and say, God, my life is not my own. My life belongs to you because I belong to you. The word tells me I belong to you. So I'm getting rid of me. I'm, may I decrease that you may increase in my life. <laughs> so he says, whosoever shall lose it for my sake. He says, and the gospels, and the gospels. Many people will say, well, you know, for Jesus' sake, for his name's sake, well, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian, so I'm laying down my life. Well, what about the gospel? That's what Christians are supposed to live by. Not just having the name of a Christian and wearing it as a badge. You also lose your life to the gospel. To say the gospel has precedence in my life. That is what I live by. Not my own selfishness. I live by that word of God. So let's look at it again. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's. I'm talking about the gospel's sake. That doesn't just mean a, like a physical death. When you look at this in, in the Greek, it's talking about you, you lay it down, you deny yourself, you destroy, you make perish, you get rid of those things of the old way of living. He says, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or <laughs> what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What are you willing to exchange for your soul. The very soul, that will, the very soul that you're supposed to be given to God, your very essence of what's supposed to be in heaven, what are you willing to exchange that for? Now here's something to think about. The word exchange means ransom. What are you willing to ransom for your soul? If you want to write this down, 1 Timothy 2 6. 1 Timothy 2.6 says Jesus was our ransom. That already tells us who is supposed to be the ransom, what we're supposed to exchange, what we're supposed to have marked on our life, what, was, what the price is that's being used to purchase us. But it says Jesus, even before his own death, says what shall a man exchange? What were you going to ransom? What are you going to change out for your own soul? That'd be a question I like to ask a lot of Christians. What are you willing to exchange for your own soul? Because many people are going really cheap. Many people are going really cheap. Some people are going for drugs, sex, not married sex, but maybe adulterous or fornication, going for lying. Because remember, all liars have their part in the lake of fire. Giving up on God? Because the Bible tells us we're not of those who draw back into perdition, to destruction. You name it, you can, change your, you can exchange your soul for it. But it doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it worth it. 
Many people are selling themselves really cheap in the eyes of the enemy because they think, well, I know better. Well, I, this, this means more to me. Well, it does now, but for all eternity, when you're looking up and, and wondering, man, why did I ever exchange my soul for that? That was temporary, but this is eternal. Why did I exchange my soul? Why did I exchange my eternity for that pleasure of sin for a season? Hmm. Verse 38. Whosoever, therefore, shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. (laughs) That's not just talking about adulterous as in Married sex with somebody else outside their partner. That's talking about spiritual adultery. Which is happening a lot in these days. Spiritual adultery. But see, I love how Jesus, because he's the son of God, he's wise. He says, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. The adulterous applies to the Christians who have committed adultery against God. The sinful is just those who are in sin and have never given their heart and life to God, who don't want to follow after God. Hmm. So even Jesus breaks it into two categories, adulterous and sinful. It says, Of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Chapter 9, verse 1. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now, here's, I want us to see a couple of things from this. Jesus declared that the power of God's kingdom would come even before some of these people would die. Some of his disciples is who he's talking to. And it says, says that there will be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death. Which means they're not going to die. He's talking about a natural death. Some of you is not going to die before I come back in my kingdom with power. Before I come back with the kingdom of God in power. Now, if you study this out, there's a lot of different ideas on this as far as theologians and commentaries and things of that nature. Some say, well, that's goes with that power that he's talking about has to do with the Jesus being transfigured because that's exactly what happens next. Okay, well, none of them died before that happened because they're all here. They're all present and accounted for. Yes, we know that three of them go with him, but I think Jesus is talking on a bigger scale. What is part of the power that he was going to come back with? Well, one of that would be his resurrection. By then, who had died? Judas. So that means the other 11 are still alive, but one of them did die. Because notice he says some of them that are here. He didn't say all. He said some. Okay. Next big thing to happen as far as the church age. Day of Pentecost. Well, we know Judas, he's already gone. But all of these people, all the disciples are there along with some other people that are gathered in the upper room, what comes? How is the Holy Spirit described to come in power? Okay, that's awesome. If We can see that. They were all there for it. None of them has died yet. But as the church age progresses, the power is more established and more established because of them obeying the Word of God, because of them obeying God. They're making disciples. They're making new converts. They're seeing the kingdom expand and grow, even though persecution's coming against them, even though that some, some of the disciples becoming apostles, they start dying off one at a time, or however you want to say that. They start dying off till you get to John, and he's the last one. Well, what does he see? He gets the book of Revelation. So he sees it in a spiritual eye, not in natural eyes. But I also think that these guys, because they tasted death, physical death along the way regarding this happening, they got to see the kingdom of God come with power. But what about us? Do we not get to see the kingdom of God come with power? Through the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Through Jesus and 
through Jesus' kingdom being set up and preach, Him being preached, the gospel going forward. But won't we get to see it in a bigger scale of Jesus coming back to gather, gather God's children? Won't we get to see it in a bigger scale when, when Jesus comes back and touches down for the actual second coming? Not just the rapture, but His second coming when He puts His foot on the, the earth again to wage war? But yes, we know that by now, all of the disciples have died, so they have tasted death. But there's so much more to the power of the kingdom of God than what we want to give it credit. We'll just say, well, that's nice. Some of them didn't die before the power came. Well, the power is still here. But how are we to receive the power? By the Holy Ghost, who we're to be the temple of. So if you have no power of God in your life, you may wonder, Am I really a temple of God or am I a temple of self? And have I been baptized in the things of God to have that power and authority not only in me but on me to go and to do what God's called me to do? Because there's a difference. I've met plenty of people that are born again that love God but they have no power and authority. Why? Because they're not baptized in the Holy Spirit. They may have... Every once in a while they may have that anointing to do something, but as far as it being a constant thing that is present in their life, I know people right off the top of my head. I know some preachers and pastors like that. I know some wonderful Christians like that. I'm not saying they're going to hell. That's not by any means because they're born again. But walking in that power and authority, I can see the anointing flare up. God will use them. But then it's like it goes away. Why? Because they don't walk in that baptism, they don't walk in that power and that strength of what God has for them. When it's available to each and every one of us anytime we want it. That's like, today we could give an altar call. If you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, you can receive it. Then it's up to you to walk and be at temple and allow allow God to lead you by His Spirit. But God's, God and the Holy Spirit are gentlemen. They're not going to force themselves on you. It's only if you want it. Verse 9, or chapter 9, verse 1 again. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. He said, I'm giving you my word. Some of you guys will still be here when you begin to see this power of God's kingdom come into play. Because you also got to remember, at the time that they're hearing this, Their leader, Jesus, is being sought after to be persecuted, sought after to be executed, and it looks like he's not going to get to establish his kingdom on earth like like they all thought he would. So in essence, the enemy is trying to tell them, your leader is a failure. Your leader is a failure. Your leader is a failure. Why else would Jesus say, I'm telling you right now, many of you will not die before you start seeing the power of God come and start being established of what I've been saying, what I've been preaching, what I've been teaching you guys, what you guys have been preparing for. This thing is coming, so don't let the enemy deceive you that it's it's in vain. The same could go for us as a church. Don't let the enemy say, what you're doing is not taking place. What you're you're doing has no effect. Oh, on contraire, mon cher. (laughs) To quote the wise Steve Urkel. (laughs) But with this, we can see that the kingdom of God has power to it. And just because we can't see the big, the whole picture of everything that's going on doesn't mean there's no power. So we've got to walk in that power, walk in that anointing by being the temple of God, being holy, being clean, not living life unto ourselves, but living our life unto God. So Jesus practiced what he preached. Let's go to Luke chapter 22. Jesus practiced what he preached. Luke chapter 22, verse 39. Luke 22, 39. And he came out and went as he was wont, or we would say a custom, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter in you pray that ye enter not into temptation. 
Pray that you enter not into, and that word temptation means an experience of evil. Or we would say adversity or difficulty. So Jesus is telling them, pray that you don't enter into this experience of evil. Pray that you don't enter into adversity. Pray that you don't enter into difficulty. <laughs> he didn't say it wouldn't, wouldn't come. He says, pray that you don't enter into it. Because how many times do we pray against things and say, Father, may, you know, may our household be healthy. May, our, may we have plenty of money. May we be able to do this. May we be able to do that. But yet, we know that those things may try to come up against us. But how much worse would it be if we didn't pray to combat those things? Just food for thought. Verse 41. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, stone's throw, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, notice, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. What is Jesus doing? He's giving us the example of being the temple of God. He said, I don't belong to myself, Father. He says, you know, I don't want to do this. He says, if, it's, if, if you're willing, please remove this cup from me. May we have another way. He said, but nevertheless, nevertheless, not my will. Now, will there means not my choice, not my pleasure, not my determination. That's what will means. Not my choice. Not my pleasure. Hmm. You mean the opposite of the modern church. The opposite of the way the enemy wants you to live is for your pleasure. That's exactly the opposite of what Jesus says. And if we're to be Christians, to be Christ-like, that means we're supposed to pray this same thing. Father, if it be your will to remove this from me, but Lord, not my will, but your will be done. <laughs> we just use this as an example. Lord, you know I don't want to be a missionary to Africa, but Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Is it getting all hot and sweaty and not having air conditioning really good or have, not having this, not having that. Lord, you know, that's not my cup of tea, but Lord, if that's what you want, that's what I'll do. Because it's not about me, my, it's not about my pleasure, it's not about my choice, but Lord, it's all about yours. Now, I'm just using that as an example. So whatever your fill in the blank there is, you fill it in and say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Because it's not my life is not about me. It's not about my choice. It's not about my pleasure. It's not about my determination. But it says, but thy will be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Hmm. You mean that Jesus, the Son of God, who said, it's not about me, it's about you, Father, when he says that, when he prays that, all of a sudden supernatural provision and things come to him to help him. Maybe that's many Christians' problem. They don't pray, not my will, but your will be done because they're lacking provision. They're too busy saying, well, God, I'm doing this and I want you to bless it. God, I'm doing this. This is my choice. This is my pleasure. This is my determination. So you got to bless it. And with that kind of attitude, that supernatural provision is not going to come. But when we have the attitude of not my will, but your will, God, then supplies comes. That's another evidence for us as a church. Every time we stand for the truth, and people either want to run their mouth, leave, whatever the case may be, I say, I don't care if it's me and the camera, God's going to supply, and we're going to keep preaching the word. And God has not failed us, nor will he. Nor will he. I'm not saying that I'm the hottest stuff. I'm not saying I'm the best pastor. I'm not saying that. I'm human. I'm a man. I'm going to make mistakes. But when we as a church cry out unto God and say, God, not our will, but your will be done. God can honor that. That's what God honors. Even if we do mess something up, we can say, Father, well, we missed that. Forgive us. We repent. Let's move on. Let's. Do what you want done. That's the, that's the sign. That's the sign of a true church seeking God. Is he makes sure that everything is taken care of because they have a heart after him. Not their perfection. Verse 44. 
And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer, he was come to his disciples. He found them sleeping for sorrow and said unto them, Why sleep ye? Arise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. He says, Stay awake. Don't you know, if you, if you don't stay awake, temptation is going to come. This experience of evil is going to come. This adversity is going to come. This difficulty is going to come because you're not praying. Well, what prayer should they be praying? Not my will, but your will be done. Help us not to go into temptation. Help us not get into these things and not our will, not our pleasure, not our choice, but Lord, yours. May yours be done. But see, here they are. They're asleep. They don't hear what Jesus prays. So obviously he has to go back and tell them what he prayed. To say, you need to pray the same thing. (laughs) Would to God more Christians would wake up. Awaken to righteousness. Awaken unto the things of God. Awaken in these last days to not be deceived. Last verse, 1 John. 1 John chapter 4. Last verse. 1 John chapter 4, verse 13. Verse John 4, 13. Hereby know we that we dwell in Him, and He in us, because He hath given us of His Spirit. Which means again, We dwell in Him because He's given us a Spirit and the Spirit dwells in us. So that again makes us the temple of God. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Notice, we have seen and do testify. That means not only do you perceive it, but you do something with it. That means you're not just... Understand it, you do something. Because why? Faith is going to act. Faith, true faith is going to act. <laughs> Verse 14. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. He says, We believe this, we've seen this, we testify of it. Verse 15. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God. God dwelleth in him, and he in God. Now, I have read this verse as a Baptocostal, and I have thought, well, anybody that can say Jesus is the Son of God, they must be all right with God. But then it dawned on me. The devil can say that Jesus is the Son of God. Does that make him right with God? No. So, as... Late, as pre-service prayer this morning, while people were seeking God, crying out to Him, and moving in the Holy Spirit, which shows you the importance of pre-service prayer, the Lord shows me this verse. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in Him, and He in God. I thought, all right, Lord, I've I've read that, and I've read that, and I've read that. God said, what about, what does confess mean? Okay. So I looked up the word confessed. Confess. It means acknowledge By making a covenant that recognizes. Acknowledge by making a covenant that recognizes it. That recognizes that Jesus is the Son of God. God dwells in Him and He in God. So not only do you confess it because you recognize it. Because you acknowledge it. Well, yeah, Jesus is the Son of God. But there's a deeper meaning that we may overlook. Because it says you acknowledge it so much that you make a covenant with God that recognizes that Jesus is the Son of God and God dwells in Him. It's talking about whosoever. It's not just talking about Jesus, that God dwells in Jesus and Jesus in Him. It says that whosoever confesses this, he'll confess, he'll declare, make a covenant because Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in Him, and He dwells in God. That's the covenant. That's what's missing in a lot of Christians, so to speak. Well, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Like we talked about in Sunday school. They believe they've got to be nice. They've 
They got to believe they, they got to be happy. And they believe that God exists, so they're good to go. And as long as they can say, Jesus is the Son of God, then they, they're good to go. No, that's inaccurate. This verse tells us we've got to establish a covenant with God. And God is to dwell within us. And by Him dwelling in us, we dwell in Him. Because we're in a relationship, we're in a covenant that extends further and deeper than what we can truly comprehend just being surface Christians. But verse 16, And we have known and believed the love that God hath, toward, God hath to us. God is love. And many people want to quote that, but they'll leave everything else out. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. So in other words, when you have this covenant, you make known and believe that the love of God and that he has to us, well, of course, that's what one of the things that brings us in as a believer. God is love. Yep. And he that dwelleth, he that abides in love, dwelleth in God. Because when you love God and you serve him, you take on more of his characteristics and less of the world. So some of that love to the world looks like tough love or looks like brotherly love or looks like whatever. And so many people, get, they get hung up on those things. They say, well, just because you know, you've got to love, you've got to love, you've got to love, that means you have to love somebody in their sin and not say anything. That's not love because that's not why God says to love. God said he, ch- he chastises whom he loves. That means he gets on to them. You know better than this. Come on. Come on, you know better than this. Get out of this rut. Get out of this. Don't be in this. Come on. But he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Verse 17, herein is our love made perfect, or our love made mature, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. How on God's green earth are you going to have boldness in the day of judgment unless you've been walking with him, you've been clean, you've been holy, you haven't been perfect, but you've made a covenant that you have kept with him. There is no other way to be bold in the day of judgment. Especially when you know that you've been crooked, you know you've been dirty, you know you haven't kept your part of the covenant, when you know that you haven't done what you should have done. I mean, just a silly example, when you're driving down the road and all of a sudden you see a cop on the side of the road, and you start wondering, man, am I speeding? Am my tags up to date? Am I this? Am I that? Am I li- is, my, is my license up to date? Is my insurance up to date? You start rolling through all of your mind, you start panicking of what could be out of sorts. But when you know that your license is good, you know your insurance is good, you know you're not speeding, you know all of your lights and turn signals and everything works on your vehicle, you can drive right by and say, yep, how you doing, officer? Praise God that you're there keeping us safe. You have a boldness. Why? Because you know you're not dirty. You know you're not out of line. But unless you make this covenant with God, you won't have that boldness on the day of judgment. It'll be like, oh, I hope I, hope I make it. I hope, hope I make it. Hope I make it. No, no, no. It's not a boldness of an arrogance, but it's a boldness of, God, you know I've, been, I've not been perfect, but you know I've been with you all along the way. Every time I messed up, I repented. I tried to honor you the best I could in my life. I honored you. I kept my covenant. It wasn't perfect, but God, I kept it. So, Lord, here I am. I'm your child. I'm your servant. That gives us boldness in the day of judgment. It says, because as he is, so are we in this world because as he is because as he is we are here unless you're like he is here then you won't have that boldness and you're not keeping your covenant they said that's a high price to pay but jesus gave his life for us that we could have eternity as i've often heard it like even my dad has said it, and maybe other preachers when I was growing up said it. They said, he died for me. The least I could do is live for him. So I say, Lord, whatever you want, I'm your child, I'm your servant, so have your way in me. So are you the temple of God? Are you keeping your covenant with him as you should? Because remember, that verse says, that last verse we read, it says, as he is, we're to be in this world. So last time I checked, God's clean, God's holy. God's got a lot more going on for him than what we can contribute to our own lives by doing it ourselves. We've got to rely on our relationship with him. That we are holy, that we're clean. Because we're quick to repent. We're quick to make things right with God and to walk with him. 
So may we do so. May we be the temple, realizing that we have the power and authority available to us to walk in such a boldness, to walk in that covenant, but only if you want to. Because if you don't want to, God's not going to make you. And it'll be you that chooses where your eternity and how your life goes. So choose wisely. So be the temple of God. Amen. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. May you help us this morning to see the areas of our life that we need to step up in, that we need to correct. May we be the temple of God. May we not become arrogant. May we not become prideful. May we not become religious. But Lord, may we truly be the temple of God, that we house your Holy Spirit on the inside of us. May we be baptized in the Holy Spirit to have that power and authority upon us and within us, Lord, that we can walk in what you will say for us to do. That We can be salt. We can be light. We can be everything that you want us to be. And Lord, may you help us to be clean. Help us to be holy people. Because Father, we need you. May we take our covenant with you very seriously. So Lord, these are the last days. And I know, Lord, that that may sound cliche, but Lord, we really are here. This is not the time to play games with you. So may you forgive us if we have. May you help us to see the severity of these last days. See the severity of our relationship with you. How important it is. And may we not hold back, Father. May we not hold back any of our life away from you. But may we submit everything to you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for establishing a covenant with us. Father, may we do our due diligence to honor our part of the covenant, to love you, to walk with you, to serve you all the days of our life. Not just today, not just on the days we have service, but Lord, every day. We thank you and we love you, God. Thank you, Father. If you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Caleb, I've, maybe I've been, I've been born again, but I am not where I need to be with God. I have walked away from Him. And yes, we all make mistakes. We all sin. We need to be quick to repent. But you know in your heart that you have turned your back on God. And you have stated by doing so that you didn't want that relationship, but now you want to renew that relationship. You want to refresh that relationship with Him. If that's you this morning. You'd like for me to pray with you if you would to raise your hand. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Amen. 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 Well, let's pray this together. Maybe just a confession of what we've heard this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, I declare I want to be a temple of God. May your spirit be within me. May your spirit be upon me. May I walk in the power and the authority that you have for me. I thank you for my salvation. I take my covenant seriously. May I be clean. May I be holy. May I be quick to repent when I mess up. I love you. May I serve you all the days of my life. May I always know you, and may you always know me. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Well, praise God. Well, we'll be back tonight at 6 o'clock. We'll have our fellowship Bible trivia night, celebrate Thanksgiving as a church family. So maybe that's the reason it's a little bit hotter this morning, so we could relax tonight. <laughs> we'll see. Amen. If not, I'll just, we'll just preach tonight. I'll just stand down there and preach. Amen. <laughs> it's a joke. You don't have to look so sourpuss at me. Whew, man. Y'all getting religious on me. <laughs> don't do that. We're teaching against that. Don't be that. Amen. <laughs> well, love you. May you have a good afternoon. Remember, we are finishing up the bake sale for today. So all that will go to the mortgage payments, things of that nature. So we'll be here. Uh, come a little early so we can start at 6. Uh, so that way we have all the food and things ready. So we'll see you tonight, and dress is a little more casual, so 
Uh, don't have to dress up like you come into church like right now, but you know, I do want to be honorable in the house of God, but you know, a little more relaxed because we'll be fellowshipping and just enjoying some time as a church family. So love you. Have a good afternoon, and we'll see you tonight. Amen.